Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Explain It. My name is Caroline, and this is my lovely co-host, Ingrid Hernandez. Um, we thought about adding a third co-host. We thought it might get a little confusing, but we just asked Matthew Potter to come back again. So the short sale king, who's closed over 18,000 short sales since 2008, jumped back in to give us a part two yeah. from a previous episode that we've recorded. Um, what I do want to just ask, guys, this is a free form of education that we'd like to help and share with you all. So if you could, please, please, please go to that subscribe button, like button, share this with everybody that you know, give a comment. We are trying to grow this and let more people know about it. With that being said, Ingrid, I haven't seen you since you were in Florida. Where are you right now and what's going on? I'm at Starbucks. Um, as people know, I have a W-2, but uh, I had to leave the W-2 for the day and uh, made sure I was uh, in a place that I could be on the podcast because something that we've learned is consistency is important and I'm just making sure I'm always on here, 4 p.m. Wednesday. I love it. Well, Matthew, thank you for coming back. I know this is a, a last minute ad and I have had so many people, I've talked about the episode where you came on, so many people loved you coming on to explain it. Um, I had a few people that I sent the video to today because- I've messaged you offline. I'm really focusing on those families that are in pre-foreclosure. And I, I door knocked last week on a house and sadly I wasn't able to, I didn't have enough conviction or convincing to a family that had children and their house went to auction and that just crushed me. So I'm going all in on this. This is my sole focus. I want to make sure that we can really help families that are affected by everything. What, what would you say got you started in this? And let's just kind of jump into what's happened in the last few weeks since we had an episode with you last. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's like I was telling you guys, like it's been a wild last two weeks. It, it has, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, I mean, we were on here and I was like, oh, okay, you know, like there's always short sales, you know, they come, they go, things like that. And then that happened the banks, you know, all of a sudden we had the failure of SVB and then we had Signature, like most people don't even know that Signature was like quietly closed in New York um, on a Sunday. Like it literally, how do you get fired on your day off? Like you're closed on a Sunday and you got shut down. So that was pretty wild to me when that happened. And then um, people that are much, much smarter than I am um luckily will share information with me and they kind of let me know that credit suisse was on its way out and they're like look this is definitely something we want to watch because as terrifying as signature bank or not uh yeah svb was credit suisse holds like four times as many assets and that's a bit like i mean that's a big global lender right there and as soon as like that, and like the thing that's funny is most people are like, oh, well, UBS came in and bailed them out. I don't know how many people are aware of that or saw that yesterday. This is the thing that's wild on that though. Okay, I, you know what? I kind of want to recap because I'm not even sure. I'll, I didn't know about these other extra banks. What, what has been happening in the last two weeks just for people that are going to be listening to this and not watching us and maybe didn't catch the last episode? Got it. So... The and I apologize. Sometimes my brain just goes into. I'm going to like, jump in. I'm going to be a moderator. <laughs> I'm gonna break it down for me. <laughs> Thank God. So just tell me to pause every now and then. So you know, I got you. What? So what essentially happened was, and for those that were around in 08, it was very similar to that. What happened was it was a run on the bank. So what happened was the bank had, and to understand this, you have to look at our banking system as a whole we have what's known as fractional, fractional lending. So the bank, for every dollar that's there, they can lend $10 conservatively, and they're in a good spot based on their deposits that are there. The issue that you run into is when you go above that 250000 threshold for like a personal account, all of that money is uninsured. So if there's a run on the bank and everybody pulls their money at once, the bank, because they have so much that's out, they just collapse. And they don't have the money on hand to be able to actually give to all their customers. So it's actually a really terrifying thing. So the way that this one was equated was back to WAMU, Washington Mutual, when it collapsed in 08. I mean, when this happened, I literally texted one of my lender partners and I was like, dude, this has some really, really, really 08 vibes to me. 
I know that it's a little different, but man, this is feeling really similar. And he was like, yeah, he's like, this ain't the first, he's like, this won't be the last one. And then literally two days later, the same thing happened. Um, and then, like I said, it's just progressively gone from there with Credit Suisse. And then um, there's some rooms that, you know, for example, he's involved in that are some of the smartest dudes on the planet when it comes to lending, mortgages, uh, mortgage-backed uh, securities, things like that, where they're like, look, this is the tip of the iceberg from what we're seeing. There's going to be some big names that are going to follow right behind this. And I think you already saw, or it's been going on, Republic Bank, JP Morgan kind of threw a lifeline. But the thing that's interesting that most people kind of aren't taking into account, everybody keeps saying the banks aren't being bailed out. That we're not bailing them out because let's be honest, like that's got a horrible connotation to it, especially going back to the Great Recession. Like that leaves a really bad taste in the taxpayer's mouth. Yep. Instead, and this is the thing that's kind of twisted, is this go round, it's we're not going to bail the banks out. We're going to make sure that the people that bank there are going to be made whole, which sounds great. Like on paper, that sounds fantastic. Like oh, cool, I got $3 million in a bank account. I'm getting $3 million back. What they're doing, though, is they're doing an equity strip. So if you say that there's stock in that bank of, I don't know, just say there's like a billion dollars worth of stock that's out. Okay. All of those investors are wiped out. They're gone. So if you're a stockholder in that bank, you're gone. No more. No more. Like if your portfolio said that you had $5 million in stock that morning, you're now at zero. And that's the thing where when they're saying like, oh, hey, we're not going to do this to the taxpayer. Well, you just did it to Main Street, though. Like, let's be honest. Most of your people that are involved in stocks are your 401ks, your IRAs, your, your Main Street, your people that are just trying to get ahead. And they're just completely wiping them out. And like with SVB, I think it was something ridiculous. It was something like. Two point eight uh, billion dollars was just wiped out. Like it was gone in 24 hours. And I'm like, damn, okay. Um, so it's what it's one of those things like looking at where the banking system is right now, I think it's extremely fragile and you're going to see more go over the edge. And I think the federal government, and like, this is one of the things like I know that everybody likes to, everybody likes to pick on Powell and like, let's be honest, he has like the shittiest job on the planet right now being in charge of the fed because oh he's, damned if he does and he's damned if he doesn't like, there's no way to win. You got yelling, sitting there being like, we should fire him. And it's like, no, like, dude, I wouldn't, you couldn't pay me enough to have that job. Mm -hmm. He affected. And I'll, I'll give him credit where credit's due today. He effectively said we are committed to getting inflation down where it needs to be to right the ship. Because he effectively said, look, we know there's kinks in the armor of the banks right now. Like we're seeing that their deposit, they don't have enough on, on hand to cover their deposits. They, mm -hmm. you know. And let's talk about they, why, Matt, you can see the comment below. Why is there not enough in the banks at the moment to cover the deposits? Because when COVID happened, we did quantitative easing and we effectively dropped the, the Fed funds rate to zero. So, I mean, it was banks could just pass money back and forth and we literally were just printing it. That's all that we were doing. And like, this is something that's wild. This goes all the way back to, I want to say it was early last year, one of my lender partners had said to me, this isn't going to be good when the hangover comes. And I was like, you know, at the time, like I'm doing 70, 80 deals a month for a hedge fund. And I'm like, look, like, dude, I'm just going to stack it while I can. And then whatever happens, happens. And he's like, I don't think that most people understand where this is going. The, when the club shuts off and we're not serving drinks anymore and you, the lights are on and you got to go home. There's about $14 trillion that has been printed in the last two to three years that we have to cook off to get inflation back to 2%. Like, wow. we're not talking like, hey, we need to go lose $100. Like, you're talking like, we're up here and we need to be down here. 
Sorry. The most we've ever printed ever in the ever of ever. Of ever. Like uh -huh. between, I think it was like between when the Federal Reserve became a thing to 2020, we had printed something like, I don't know, it was something dumb, but it was like $8 trillion or something like that. From 2019, 2020 to 2022, we printed like $14 trillion. And, you know, that was the government stimulus checks and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So when that happened, what happens is you have to offset that with something. And it's going to be pain. They're going to bring pain to the, to the table. And you're starting to see it. You're seeing pain in banks. You're seeing pain in Main Street. You're seeing sellers that, okay, like, crap, dude, I'm living paycheck to paycheck and I just got cooked off my job and, you know, mm -hmm. all these jobs are supposedly being added to the economy, but I'm looking for work and I can't find anything. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, like, you're, you're starting to see it. The, the Fed, their only thing that they have to combat all of this is destroying demand, which is what they're doing. They're destroying demand by raising that Fed funds rate. And in doing so, they're also cooking off the equity that's in the uh, that's in the housing market. They're cooking it off with the equity that's in Wall Street. Um, they're also cooking off a lot of the equity that's in the banking system, and it sucks. But they're gonna they're gonna take it down brick by brick. They will until they get things where it should be. Had we not had that once in a lifetime event of. COVID, the pandemic, quantitative easing, easing um, 0% interest rates. I mean, for the love of Christ, when you have like multi-billion dollar corporations borrowing billions of dollars at less than a percent, like that's insane. <laughs> that, that should not, that, that should never work for any banking institution. And then all it takes is like one small increase in interest rates and now you're operating at a loss based on your interest payments that you're getting from them. You're at a loss. Right. right. So here's a graph um, that I quickly found. 35% of all U.S. dollars in all existence were printed in a matter of 10 months. Mm -hmm. 35 months. You know, or, excuse me, 10 months. 35%. That's, that's an extreme circumstance. Obviously, the pandemic did crazy crazy things to us and now to your point we're in the hangover stage yes. so what is coming of this like what are some of the uh, like effects of of this impact of 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 what we've done to ourselves so what we're seeing is and this is what i'm seeing and i'm in a lot of different markets nationwide i mean phoenix is my primary market but since i do short sales in all 50 states I see it in other pockets as well. So the first thing that we're seeing is, and this was something where sub two and short sales kind of almost go hand in hand. Um, say that one of the people, say, say that a borrower, say that a borrower lost their job, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how good your interest rate is. If you make $0 a month, you can't pay your mortgage. I, I, I don't know. Really yeah, your, your interest rate can be 2%. It doesn't matter. So one of two things is going to happen there. A, you're going to sell that property and maybe you're going to get your, um, your equity out of it and you're going to go rent someplace for a while. Or B, depending on when you bought, and Ingrid, we've already run into this with several people, you might be at that break even spot or you might be underwater. And if it doesn't cash flow on like a sub two or a wrap or something like that, well, hi, I'm here and I'm here to help you. And it's, then you're going into short sales and people are like, well, you know, there's only going to be like a few of those situations. And I beg to differ on that one. There's going to be a lot more of those situations than people think, because if anybody thinks that this is, that we're in the thick of it right now, the thick of it just started the other day. Like, and that's the tip. Like we haven't even gone underwater on the iceberg yet. <laughs> like we haven't seen what happens when you, when you have real life implication stress tests of your largest bank banks in the world. What happens when you're looking at Deutsch? What happens when you're looking at HSBC, Wells Fargo, B of A, Chase? Do I think they're all going to collapse? 
No, but I think you're going to start to see where their faults are. And inherently, depending on the lending institution, and let's be honest, when money's cheap, like, hey, it's a good idea. Like, dude, let's just give everybody loans. Mm-hmm. Now you're starting to see some of that come back. And now people are looking at it. And I have people that, um, you know, they bought two years ago. And people are like, oh, well, shit, they're in a great position. No, they're not. They bought two years ago. At the highest price. And, and, you know, they may, they may have bought it X and they paid 25K above asking because that's what the market was. And it didn't matter. They got the appraisal. So, and they were only putting 5% down. So they were already 20% above or, you know, 20K above that. Well, now if the price has come down 50,000 on that house, okay, you're underwater. Like you are, you may have a bitch in interest rate, which is great. Maybe we're selling your rate. We're not selling your house. We're selling your rate and your loan that's there. That's Mm -hmm. what it is. And you're starting to see that. And a lot of people to that point will sit there and say, yeah, okay, I'm still not going to see short sales. You say that until a notice of trustee sale shows up. Notice the trustee sale shows up. All of a sudden it gets real, real, real fast. Uh-huh. And I literally got a call from a gal this morning on a property in Florida. Um, she's an escrow officer here in Arizona. She works with a nationwide uh, buyer. And she called me and she's like, yo, she's like, do you do reverse mortgages? And I was like, yeah, all day. And she's like, I'm going to get this lead over to you. She's like, "Um, if you can kick us a referral fee, that'd be great. Let me know. She's like, there's nothing that we can do with it because it's a reverse mortgage. Just get it short sold. She's like, she's underwater by 150 grand. And I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, okay. And like, we're talking Florida in what was it? I think it was like St. Pete or maybe Tampa. Those are hot markets. That's yes, not like, that's, that's, not like that's a shitty market where there's been like a can we buy it? Can we buy yeah, it? To, that's where I used to live before I came here. Yeah. Can we buy it? <laughs> I'm, I'm literally waiting on all of the um I'm waiting on all the information on it to get into my inbox. But once it's in, yeah, I'll shoot it over to you guys. You guys want to you guys want to take a stab at it? Take a stab at it. Like it's but like that's no, one of those those are those are very hot markets for that to be underwater a hundred and twenty five thousand, is that you said? Yeah. That's unthinkable that's crazy and like that and that's the thing that's wild is there's always those one-offs and people are like well it's just one off yeah it is it's just one until it's two in the neighborhood and then it's five Mm -hmm. and then the next thing you know you start to see a pattern and like i'm already seeing that with some of the areas and locations where it's you know okay you go in you know monsoon our our tax records that we use here on the realtor side all right in certain areas it gets lit up. There's, you know, 17 properties that have red, you know, mm-hmm. above it. Okay. You're in pre foreclosure. Now out of those 17, only half of them may make it to the table of short sale or needing to be sold. But that's kind of that forced inventory that the government is looking to create of, mm-hmm. we have to sell these homes. Like mm-hmm. we got to move some more inventory into the market. And how do you do that? You create unemployment. Think about it. Like, I mean, the other day this came out, um, uh, I got a, I got a message from one of our lender partners, Amazon had come out two months ago saying we're laying off 18,000 people. And I was like, Oh shit. Like, but Amazon's a huge corporation. Mm -hmm. That's 18,000 people that don't have a job and are looking now. Mm -hmm. Literally. I think it was like three, it was two days ago, three days ago. Amazon more. 9,000 more. They're laying off Mm -hmm. 9,000 more. Now you're talking about 27,000 in a two months span. Like that's something that you need to keep an eye on because, you know, like I said, is every one of those people going to end up in foreclosure? God, no. Is every one of those people going to end up in a short sale situation? No. Are there going to be some though? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. There will be. And that's just, it's playing, playing the uh, percentages that are there. So it's wild watching kind of what is happening because it's very, like I said, for me living through it and working through it, there's a lot of 08 vibes without toxic loans. Like mm-hmm. everything else okay. feels really, really, really similar. And it's not even that the loans aren't toxic. If anything, the loans, the loans are so good that people are trying to do anything they can to keep them, you know, through sub two, through, uh, um, assignment 
Um, assume, you know, well, assumable? So assuming, yeah, that's where I was going with that. So, <laughs> yeah, whatever. No, you're um, good. Um, you know, assumable loans, uh, things like that. And it's one of those things like looking at that, there's, there's only so long that people can hold on before they have to let go. And that's going to happen. And if it passes through and the rate stays there through, you know, being assumed or sub two or wrapped, great. But there's also going to be a lot of that that's going to get cooked off and it's going to have to go into the marketplace's inventory and it's going to sell in one form or another. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I said, that's kind of what I'm seeing at the moment and kind of what I'm tracking. So, Matthew, I'm curious. I mean, I know we talked about last time you were on here. I think we said there were 1,600 um, houses in pre-foreclosure in Maricopa County. Do you have an idea of like what's happened in the last few weeks? How many more people have been triggered nationwide? How many, I guess I should rewind. Do you know how many mortgages are in default in the United States at the moment or roughly? I don't know the exact amount, but I'll tell you this. I think at the beginning of the year, it was something like it was less than like uh, 1%, which historically speaking is great. Like you're, you're happy seeing that. They came out with something that it was up like 0.7. Like, okay, like that doesn't sound terrifying, but think about, think about it this way. If there's 10 million homes and you're at 1%, what is that? A million homes, something like that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. hundred thousand. Sorry. That would be a hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. Okay. If it goes up 0.7, you just threw 70,000 more homes into the mix. That's a lot. Like that adds up very, very, very quickly. And that's what they're starting to see and what they're starting to track. The other thing that's interesting to me, because my brain is wired completely different than most people's. So um, one of the most notoriously risky lenders out there is Flagstar. Okay. They're, they're not known for being, you know, cream of the crop, grade A <laughs> um, uh, paper on their loans. They okay. were just put on a federal watch list for defaults on loans uh, for their borrowers. Oh. And I was like, okay, that's interesting watching that. Now they go on and off this list a lot. But again, looking at what the last two years was, most of those loans should be pretty easy to sell from the aspect of there should be equity in the homes. But you're starting to see the equity strip out on a lot of these properties. It, 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 losing value in the homes because the affordability is gone. Most people are buying prices are dropping and there's no more equity when you go get things appraised. So Matthew, you're, I'm or Ingrid. I'm going to let you jump in after this, after I ask this question, but I've been door knocking a lot right now. And that was one of those things that scared me. I was nerve wracking. I didn't, I was always the person who would close and help people over the phone. I've been door knocking a ton and it's just the stories I'm hearing is awful. How, I mean, like, I, w I want, obviously, if I can, if any way possible, I'd love to keep a family in the home, but they they don't have any money. They can't catch up the mortgage. They've been denied um, a loan mod because these banks are behind. So many people are applying to get loan mods right now. They're having a hard time getting a hold of the bank. What? Yeah, it's impossible. So I know that you have direct contact to banks. Like, what are you seeing in this moment? And like, when you're talking to homeowners and you're trying to help them out, what is your strategy? So it's super ironic because honestly, I had a, I had a seller who I was really hoping I'd be able to do a live call actually on this with this seller. Mm -hmm. He ended up calling me at two today and he was like, bro, I know that you want to put me on this. He's like, but I just need the package now and I need to get started. Like I'm terrified that I'm going to end up in foreclosure. And I was like, well, dude, it's like two hours. Like not a lot is going to change. And he's like, yeah, no, I got to go now. Like, give me the package. I was like, all right, I ain't going to argue with you. Like, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that I'm, the thing that I'm seeing, and this is the thing that's very interesting. A, and a lot of this flies under the radar. Nobody makes mention of any of these things because if you do, it's similar to, oh, hey, I don't think our bank has enough money in it. I'm going to go pull all my money out. You know, you, you hear that. And it's like, it's like the old game of what the hell is it? Telephone where like, by the time you get to like person 50, it's like a totally different story. Mm -hmm. So I'm, 
what I'm hearing and from people that I that I trust at the lending institutions, they've ramped up their loss mitigation because they know this is coming. And what that is is that's their loan mod and their short sale department. Right now, their loan mod people are trying to do the best that they can. Here's the thing that I'll tell you with loan modifications. Inherently, it's something like 90% of them end up failing. They do. And it's kind of you're putting a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound because you're not treating and, the And when you say failing, you mean they're applying for these and they're not getting approved or they're applying for it and then they are getting auctioned off after the fact? Um, a little bit of both. So, for example, and this is the way that most banks work. They work off of what's known as a waterfall system. Um, that's one of my little keywords, waterfall. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll start off with, hey, can we just take the missed mortgage payments, slap it at the end of the loan? Will that benefit the borrower? Oh, okay. They had a temporary loss in employment. They're, you know, they're reemployed. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. If that doesn't work, they do, um, they do what's known as a deferment. They'll just move them to the, they'll move all that missed stuff and put it as like a non-interest bearing second mortgage on the property. And then whenever they go to sell it, it just shows up on title and it gets paid. Gotcha. Okay. The next thing on the list is they look at, um, at a loan modification. Now here's the thing with loan modifications, and this is across the board. If you think the bank is gonna do anything for you that's not gonna benefit the bank, you are wrong. Hang on, you can, you say that one more, can you say that one more time? I wanna make sure that we're all hearing this, because what? If you think that the bank is gonna do anything for you that will not benefit the bank, you are wrong. Okay. And they are going to, they'll keep you in that damn loan for 50 years. I've, I've had people that have done loan mods where literally their term was extended to 50 years and 2% interest rate. And because here's you, you know what's crazy about that? Sorry, I have to cut in. Okay. Is that the, the Dodd-Frank Act and the SAFE Act, I don't know which one, says that you can't amortize over 40, excuse me, over 30 years. So yes. to see these other new products, it's like, well, how does Dodd-Frank work against that kind of um, uh, modification? Is it because it's not the initial, it's the secondary, okay. it's to try to save you? So it's that. And the other thing is, and again, this goes to literally what I just said about the bank will do what's in the bank's best interest. Think about it this way. If you go and buy a property as an investor, right? And you turn around and you want to sell that thing five days later, you can't accept FHA financing, can you? But guess what? If the bank takes that thing on a foreclosure and puts it on the market five days later, boom, FHA financing. No uh -huh. problem. So they play by their own rules. They do. They have their own set of rules and it's figuring out how to navigate those. And you, I call it use your, use your enemies, use your enemy's strengths to your advantage. Like, okay, that's your strength. Like, fine. You're going to do a loan mod for 50 years. That's great. But let's break it down and let's actually look at it because usually it's it's chock full of fees. Um, there's usually like an escalation clause through the period of time. So it's like first year, your your loan payment's $300. Second year, it's $500, you know, whatever it is. And it gradually steps up. And then by the time you get to like year three, four, guess what? You're paying more than you would have been had you just kept your original loan. So when that happens, people look at it and they're like, dude, screw this. This doesn't make any sense to me. Like, why would I do this? What happens if the economy's worse? Like, what happens if the economy's worse in five years? What do I do then? Well, and this is, you know, this is one of my goofy sayings that I say that I'm sure my wife would like happily drown me in a bathtub for saying this so much, but it's true. It's better to dance with the devil you know than the one that you don't. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. me, I'm like, look, five years from now, everything may be hunky dory in your life. Hell, you may have won the lottery. You, you could be in a totally different position, good or bad. So the devil, you know, is the one right now we can short it. We can rip the bandaid off. We can be done with it and we can move it down the line. Five years from now, you'll be in a position. You can go buy again. You can, Hell, you can go buy anywhere in the country. You can utilize any type of financing you want at that point. You can do conventional, FHA, VA, 
USDA if you're in the middle of nowhere and that loan program covers the area. And a lot of times for me, when I'm talking to sellers and I see sellers in this position and I kind of break it down that way, I'm like, think of how different your, your life was three years ago. Everybody like, dude, all of our lives were different three years ago. I mean, three years ago, dude, we were all chilling in our houses. We weren't allowed to go outside. Mm -hmm. Like literally the world like put us in timeout. Yeah. It's a, it's a little bit different today. Mm -hmm. Three years from now, it's going to be a lot different too. It, it will be. And that's what I always try to tell them. Like, I know right now it sucks. Like it does. Like you're in a crappy position, but that's my job is to get you out of this crappy position. Let me give, be the solution to your issue and get you into a position where, um, you know, you're financially free, more healthy and, th you know, things of that nature. So that's what, you know, the other thing is for me, that's great. And I tell everybody this, when you're talking to them, let them know this ain't going to cost you anything. Like it's not like, that's the other thing, because let's be honest, like there's a lot of people out there that are scam artists. Like, let's just call it what it is. There's a lot of people and maybe not even scam artists. That's maybe a little bit harsh. There's a lot of people out there that are opportunistic. There we go. That's the word I want to use. And sometimes they use it in not a positive manner. But I always tell people, you know, people be like, well, how much is this going to cost? I'm like, nothing. Well, how do you get paid? I only get paid if it closes. I get paid because I'm a licensed realtor and because I have to do certain things with the pro, you know, with the process so that I can get paid. Mm -hmm. So like if I go to foreclosure, I'm like, you're in the same damn boat. You are in literally in the same boat that you're in right now. All you got to do is spend an hour filling out a packet of paperwork with me. The rest I do like everything else I do. So yeah having that conversation with people, like once they hear that of like, holy shit, like, okay. Like I fill out this packet of paperwork and I have a glimmer of hope. Mm -hmm. Whereas like right now, like, you know, a lot of people they're, they're in it. Like people are in it and they're feeling it. And like, let's be honest, when you got shit going on in your life, you don't feel good. Like you don't feel good. And you're depressed. You're anxious. You're overwhelmed. Yeah. I can only imagine how bad it is. Like it comes back to me thinking about that family I was trying to help last week. If you have kids, the thing that yeah. was gut wrenching to me, there were kids in that house, and their house got auctioned off at a sheriff's sale. Yep. The locks were changed on their home. Like they they're getting uprooted from their school. They're losing their sense of structure they had. They might not like that killed me. So do something and save yourself a little bit because also if you have that foreclosure on your record you're messed up on your credit for seven years. You're not going to be able to potentially rent places, get a loan, get a, like a mortgage, a car loan. It can mess you up from some jobs with security. Yeah. You definitely need, I'll get, I'm going to ask him one. Uh, go ahead. I'll ask him my question next. Well, I, what I was going to say is um, I short sold, you know, in 2010, I had two children. We had a situation where, you know, the market fell so like our house, we bought for $168,000 and um, we ended up selling it for 75000 And this was in what used to be Queen Creek and then they changed it to Santan Valley. They, they changed some of the zip code stuff. Um, so it was off of Ocotillo and Ironwood. I had, but for the record, I had no business buying a house way out there. Um, but in my mind, you know, we get drilled that home ownership is your way to build wealth. It's your way to actually, you know, I'm an immigrant here. So it's like Americanize yourself, right? And so because of that short sell, it actually delayed my ability to sign up for citizenship because it has so many factors once you do something, even from a short sell to a foreclosure scenario, but foreclosure is much worse. Um, I knew that that was something I may be impacted by. I may never get my citizenship if I foreclose. That was in the back of my mind. Um, now, short self still delayed my ability to apply, but it was, it was an impact. And so there's so many things. We always talk about mortgages and uh, when somebody's going through this. But if you really want to honor and help somebody going through a pre-foreclosure situation, and you're able to help in this way, you should be asking, how are you, like, how are you buying groceries? Mm -hmm. You know, wh what do you, do you need gas money? And I'm not suggesting to like hand her out cash for those scenarios, but it is a complete 
impact to your life. It's not just your mortgage. And so we rationalize. We rationalize all the time as human beings. It's in our nature. So when you're rationalizing this huge stressful thing, you're like, forget it. I'm just not even going to worry about it. Let me go worry about how do I pay, put gas in my car, how I feed my kids. I don't even want to deal with the huge stress that is this property there's more important things in my life oh, on, let me literally just, let, me, let me just call you and ask you if i can buy your house for cash let me just tell you that i can buy your house yeah. for cash screw you i just want to buy your house for cash could you guys imagine right. how awful these homeowners feel if you take the time yeah. to be genuine and mm-hmm. just see how they're doing i'm sure that's been a game changer for you matthew and i know ingrid is ingrid has helped so many families you both have when we talk to them on the phone matthew i, I know how many short sales you've done what has it been like for you on the phone on the phone and like I to your point that you just that you just touched on coming from the spot of yo I want to buy your house cash I see there's a notice of trustee sale they get that from 50,000 people because let's be honest once it's uh, once it's public record it's non-stop boom 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 I mean they're just getting inundated when you come from an approach of I I genuinely want to help you like I want, I want to help you. Like Ingrid was talking about in their mind, they don't give two shits about this house anymore. Like they're checked out of the house. One of two things is going to happen. Either a, the bank is going to help me. Shit. We all know that's not going to happen. Like the bank, the bank is going to prolong your problem. I'm going to help you face your problem. The enemy of my enemy is the bank. Let's take down those bastards at Wells Fargo or, you know, whatever banking institution. And once you have that common, you know, that common bond, all of a sudden, hey, look, and I had this conversation earlier today with a buddy of mine, and I talked about the power of we versus me. So the way that I look at this is, what are we going to do to solve this problem? Because now I'm like, if I'm talking to you, I'm invested into your problem. And like, I'm taking some of that and I'm shouldering it now. Like, you're not alone in this fight. That's what I'm here for. So it's not me wanting to buy your house or me wanting to sell your house or me wanting to do a short sale. It's we are going to get through this. We're going to get the bank off your back and we are going to get you into a better spot. And as soon as you start using those terms, holy shit, the dynamic changes. Like, I mean, it's a 180 in their mind where they're like, damn, I have an ally in this because before they're literally in the middle oh, of the island. island. Yeah, exactly. They're alone. Up. They're not even on the island anymore. They fell off the damn island and they're in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. And there's, there's no search and rescue coming. And then all of a sudden you're just paddling by like, yo, I got you. Like, hey, let me help you out. So like when I'm on the phone with people, I like, this is the part that's kind of hard. And I will like, this is probably the part that I struggle with. I try to be emotionally disconnected. And I know that's not a good thing, but I try to, because the thing is, this is one of those things that is going to, it will get, it'll get to you. It doesn't matter how many you've done. It will get to you because if you're a human being at the end of the day, you give a shit about the kids that just got kicked Mm -hmm. and then may not have dinner. Like, dude, I'll be honest with you. I helped this lady over in Maryvale. I want to say this was 2021. I went on this appointment. This was after she blew me off three times. And this was a referral from one of my really good buy and hold uh, investor clients. And he was like, dude, he's like, I promise you, she's not blowing you off. She's just got a lot of shit going on in her life. And I was like, okay, cool. I went over there. I go over there. I see this woman who life has just absolutely smacked her in the face. Like she is not feeling like she's not in a good spot. You know, my wife, my wife is an amazing human being. Anybody that's ever interacted with my wife knows that I clearly married way out of my league. Way. And she is the kindest person on the planet. She will give you anything off of her back to make your life easier. I text her and I was like, dude, she's here with like five kids and she's got no food. And she was like, cool. I'll take care of it. And I'm like, the hell are you talking about? Like, dude, you're over in Gilbert, bro. I'm in Maryvale right now. What do you mean you're going to take care of it? What did she do? She hopped on 
uh, what the hell is it? It's now Instacart. At the time, it had just been rolled out with like fries or something. She put in an order for just your basic necessities. You know, it was a couple hundred dollars worth of groceries or whatever. Puts it under her name. And then when I was leaving, I told her, I was like, hey, you need to run up to fries. There's a food, there's a food order for you. It's already paid for. Go pick it up. I will tell you this. I got this woman's short sale approved. I did. I got it approved. I got it closed for her. Had that not happened, though, I guarantee you I have a friend for life with her. A friend for life. Just because of that small piece of humanity when she felt less than human. And that, I'm not sitting there saying, like, go buy people groceries. I, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying just show people humanity and you will get the best out of them. Like, mm -hmm. you, you have to. So, like, when I'm on the phone with people, I try to not get super emotionally involved because it is, it, it, it's hard. But I still have that humanity of, like, look, we're going to do this. I'm going to be here with you every step of the way. You got me. You got Nicole. You got Marissa. That's my transaction manager who is freaking lights out. Um, we're going to get you through this. And, like, sellers are like, well, okay. You know, some of them will even be like, dude, you know, the bank already told me to go kick rocks. And I'm like, well, you know what? Let me waste my time and see if I can go ahead and get them to not kick rocks. But let, yeah. let me just do that. And Matthew, it, are there any other verticals that you also help? So one of the things that I recall from when I short sell is that not only did I have an acceleration in terms of the, the mortgage, but I also had it on my credit cards. Um, my credit cards required you know, the do on sale that you have for your mortgage, yep. you also have it on your credit cards. Yep. So um, despite the fact that I had never missed a credit card payment on the two or three credit cards I had, all of that got accelerated because what they do is they reassess your credit score. And so as your credit score is going down, your, your, your credit uh, worthiness is taking a dump, obviously. Um, do you offer any other services or do you have any partnerships or is this a opportunity um, for consolidation uh, work for those other types of lines of credit that, that uh, somebody going through a short sell may need to address? Could be an opportunity. I had a guy, um, unfortunately, he, unfortunately, he got to the point that I think he honestly just got burnt out and just was like, dude, I can't do this anymore. And I understand that to an extent. I, I do. Um, he he was really, really good with the consolidation and being able to lump sum work out of, you know, hey, if you have 15 G's of credit card debt, all right, you know, we can go ahead and get it settled for five and, um, you know, do it as a one time payment or set it up over like, you know, a two, three year period. Um, he's kind of gone the way of the dinosaur. So it's probably a, there probably is an opportunity there because that's one of the other beautiful little things that just came out. Consumer credit lines have never been this high ever in the history of ever. And it's literally right at a trillion dollars right now that's out yeah. on consumer credit lines. That's not mortgages. That's not car loans. That's literally like who you're just swiping at circle K, you know, you're buying a Mountain Dew and a pack of smokes or, you know, whatever, whatever you want to get. So I want to ask this earlier and I want to just go back through the short sales. So short sales for everybody, if you did not watch our previous episode with Matthew, you're, the bank is selling their property for a loss. They're shorting the house. Um, Matthew with loan mods, I know that you've been able to do a short sale in 24 hours as quickly as 24 hours because you have connections and you've been doing this for so long, you know the process. With How long does it take to get a loan mod approved? And do you have to start it at a certain time? Can you do a loan mod 24 hours before the, the auction? So usually this is what they're going to look at. They're going to look at, does it make, in their mind, they've already done their valuation of the property. And sometimes it's just a drive-by or sometimes... It's just, you know, an algorithm. It's Zillow or, you know, something of that nature, RPR, whatever. If they think that it's advantageous for them to just foreclose on it and then turn around and put it on the market and move it or move it into rental inventory, depending on what their mortgage-backed security paperwork looks like, um, they're most likely not going to postpone that. But your best bet for postponing a foreclosure sale 
if this borrower hasn't already gone through it, is a loan mod. Why? Because it benefits the bank. It keeps them on the hook and they're paying. Short sale, the bank's like, yeah, whatever. Like, okay, we're avoiding a couple costs. Mm -hmm. So they're not as motivated to postpone the foreclosure sale. If they're getting paid in full or all the arrears are being caught up and then, you know, the property's being sold or something of that nature. Okay. Yeah. They're fine with that. But that loan mod, like, Hey, if they can get somebody in, even if that person gets in and only makes six more payments, right? Think about six more payments and $1,500 a, a month in interest just on, on that loan. Okay. Like they just cooked in another $9,000 into their, um, you know, into their, uh, portfolio than, um, than had they not. And like, this is a thing that's wild with the, with the loan mods. They'll have you go through it. And usually on average, you should be able to get a loan mod done in about 30 to 45 days. You should. Um, that being said, it depends on the bank and depends on who owns the back end paper, who actually is the owner of the mortgage. You know, if it's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, so it's, it depends on the it depends on the lender typically. How long does it like? How long does it take? I mean, when should you start doing the loan mod process? Can you do it two days before? Like, are they kind of like, dude, you you're at the end of we're already overwhelmed by all of these mortgages trying to be refinanced. I usually tell people start it at least thirty days before the foreclosure sale, before a sheriff sale, a notice of trustee sale. You know, depending on your jurisdiction, like start it at least thirty days before. With the short sales, for example, I tell everybody I need a full package purchase contract in hand and everything submitted to the bank no less than 40 days before. And the reason oh, wow. why is, and this is like the most bass backwards thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Our wonderful friend called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, CFPB, has a guideline that says for a property to be short sold, all applicable paperwork needs to be in 37 days prior to the foreclosure sale date. So this bureau that's supposed to be protecting the consumer, which is the borrower, is sitting there saying like, dude, if it's 30 days before, yeah, sorry, tough. Like, we're just going to foreclose on you and we're going to go ahead and let our good friend over here, Bank of America, just go ahead and auction your house off. Like, it's it goes back to what I was talking about. Like the bank doesn't do anything. What's in it for them. Yeah, exactly. What's in it for them. So the loan mod is the good way to move it forward and get it postponed. And the other thing that happens with that, that I tell people, okay, if you're working with a seller and say the seller is in a position of, all right, I'm going to do a loan mod, but in the back of their mind, they're like, dude, I'm out of this house. Like I know that they're not going to approve me. I want to do a short sale, run, get everything ready for the short sale and get it in right now anyways. And then they can call and say, look, I want to cancel the loan mod. I want to move forward with a short sale. And a lot of times they'll do that. Where it's And like, that's like evidence of like incremental correct. bits that, yeah. that they attempted at, at trying to yeah. make it. It's, it's the water. Like we've yeah. gotten to the, we've gotten to the rocks now. Like now we're down mm -hmm. to the rocky shit. Like we're at short sale and foreclosure. That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have a question from Justin who says, are banks being more aggressive to foreclose? Uh, be, I'm going to assume because of interest rates, like mm -hmm. let's say, so you know, you, yeah, it's so low that at the end of the day, it's not beneficial for a bank. So they want to foreclose on the old rates that are like 3% so they can go and get a new loan on the house for 7% or whatever. You see that? Um, the, the banks, and this is where we get into the part that's. Conspiracy theory. <laughs> I won't say I've gone completely down the right side of YouTube, but I'm getting pretty close on this. Mm. So, so here's the thing. And you, let's just think about this realistically. If a bank is making 3% interest on a property and the bank is trading paper with another bank right now at what, 5% because of where the Fed funds rate is, we have negative 2% right there. This paper isn't worth shit anymore. Mm -hmm. In the bank's world, in our world, we love that paper. Like we love that 3%. I want to have that mortgage for the next 40 years. Mm -hmm. The bank doesn't though. The bank, like what, what is the true benefit for the bank? Banks not, think about it this way. For every one loan in the new market that we have, the 6 to 7%, they have to have 2 to 3 loans at the 2 to 3%. 
So think about it. Yeah, they can cook off. They can cook off 66% of their, um, of their portfolio and just replace that 66% with literally, you know, uh, 33% of the new, um, you know, the, the new interest rate and they're performing the same. Actually, they're performing better at better. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's for me, like when I look at that, I'm like, yeah, shit, that's kind of like, I've gone behind the curtain and looked and been like, Oh God, I don't like what's back there. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm seeing them look at it more realistically of look, if we think that we're going to make money on it, yeah, we're going to push it through and yeah. we'll, let it, we'll let it turn into, you know, we'll, we'll let it turn into a foreclosure asset and we'll go ahead and resell it. Same, same thing goes for the short sale side of them being more uh, motivated to do short sales though, because at the end of the day, short sale foreclosure in a bank's mind, it's kind of the same. Because either way, the asset's being sold and the loan's being extinguished. So there's going to be a new loan on the other side. And that's mm-hmm. what they care about. They care about picking up that paper versus servicing the paper that's way below what the market is right now. Ingrid, do you want to ask this next one? Um, well, I was just, so the question with Joel and I, do you think sharing your link tree is the best approach, uh, Matthew, in it? Cause th- he's asking, can you work directly with short sale agents or agents doing foreclosures? Yes, absolutely. I, I have a lot of Egypt partners that I work with all over the country. Um, and a lot of people will bring me deals and be like, Hey, I found this one. And the agent on the other side will be like, look, like, I have a good idea of what's going on with the short sale. I'm like, cool. I'm like, who's your investor on the loan? And they're like, well, I don't have an investor offer. And I'm like, that's not exactly what I was asking. (laughs) And um, then all of a sudden, like once we kind of get talking, they're like, yo, like this is um, all right. Yeah. Like I want to, uh, I want to go ahead and have you help because again, like at the end of the day, and this goes back to my original um, short sale days, yeah, I might take 1% off the top, but you know what? Two and a half percent or 2% of something is better than a hundred percent of nothing. So like, uh-huh. let, let me come in, let me go ahead and help you out. That's all it comes down to. As long as the, um, as Can long I as the, it? what's up? Can a wholesaler work with you? Yeah, a wholesaler? Yes, absolutely. A lot, we get a lot, we get a lot of properties from uh, wholesalers as well, where they come in. And what we do there is twofold. Number one, if they have an agent relationship that they like, we just tell them like, Hey, your agent has to agree to work with us, but we'll have them list it. They can double end it. If their broker doesn't allow double end, then we can figure, you know, something else out. We can have another agent represent, you know, whatever to meet the bank's requirements. Or if it's a situation where they don't have a, um, an agent relationship, then we just work with a partner agent in that area and then have them do the bank compliance part with listing it and everything. And then we have the wholesaler submit an offer, um, to go ahead and purchase the home. Okay. And then can a wholesaler work with you to just help the seller and not necessarily make an offer? Yes, they, certainly. And we have a lot, we have, I literally got a one in, I want to say it's Louisiana. Don't quote me on that, but I think it's Louisiana this morning where the guy was like, look, it's rural. It's in the middle of nowhere. I just want the seller to get help. Like, dude, just, will you just take care of it? And I was like, yes, absolutely not a problem. He's like, thanks. He's like, I don't need anything. I don't want anything. He's like, I'll, I'll get on the next one with you. He's like, this just isn't kind of in our portfolio. And I was like, Hey, I'm like, I'll go ahead and help them out. Not an issue. Yeah. Um, and then there's the link on your link tree that says nationwide short sell or short sale help. Is that how people get a hold of you then? Yes. That's, uh, the easiest way it comes right into my email box. Um, and, uh, I will personally be the one that's responding to it right out of the gate. It's nobody else. It's not automated or, you know, a VA or anything. It's me. <laughs> mm-hmm. So how, how does a loan mod affect the owner, uh, in terms of credit? Do you, are you familiar with that? Um, It's not necessarily a new loan and it's not necessarily a new credit poll. What actually affects the borrower on that is any missed payments up until the loan mod is made. Because, 
every time you miss a payment, you go 30 day, 60 day, 90 day late. That's what brings your credit score down. It's not technic it's not really the loan mod. It's not even the short sell. And actually the thing that's funny about that is your credit score will be doing this during the process. And then as soon as it's done and it's completed, usually your credit score goes up, even including a short sell. Like I have people that are like, dude, my credit score went up 30 points. And I'm like, great. Like, you might want to hang tight before you go get a credit card. Just saying. <laughs> okay. Um, so Matthew, how many people have you been talking to in the last week because of everything that's happening with the banks? On average, four to five actual sellers that are in short sale situations. Is that normal or is that higher? That's much higher. As a, I would say I was doing probably, I was probably doing four to five a week. Now I'm doing four to five a day. Wow. Wow. So I mean, <laughs> you're talking, you're talking about an, you're talking about a, about a, what is that? 500% increase. So, I mean, it's, yeah. it's gone, very it, 2008 vibey for sure. Yeah. Like I said, it's kind of one of those things. Like I even have like a moment at the kitchen counter the other day where Nicole looked at me and she's like, ah, shit, you're emotional right now. And I'm like, it just, I'm like, Oof. I'm like, it's, I, I, I'm like, I know that I will be okay. And I know that my skill set is going to help a lot of people and that I'm grateful for. It's just, I don't want to see anybody actually have to go through what we're about to go through. And that's the yeah. thing that sucks because it's like, like I said, I mean, from 08 through 2013, I pretty much like, dude, I'm not going to lie. I pretty much ran off of monster and nicotine. Like that was it. Like, dude, I used to smoke. I don't anymore. I'm healthy now. Mm -hmm. um, but it was one of those things like, I think I slept like three hours a night because like the other thing is it's, it's not even just from my horrible habits at the time. It's because I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about this client. I'm thinking about this client. I'm thinking about crap. There's a foreclosure sale coming up in three days. And like you were saying, uh, Carolyn, like crap, like dude, they got four kids and they're still living in the home. Like, I need to yeah. so what's make up, it Matthew? Are we, are we gonna are we gonna start teaching more agents how to do this like how do we build up a band and how do we like you know get an art or i shouldn't say a band i should say an army of people who can help I, um i th i think we're honestly probably gonna have to do that and like i've already noticed it like we have several people um that have reached out to me and they're like look like just let us know what we're supposed to do. Um, let us know, like, give us the package, give us like just some training and we'll go be, you know, we'll go beat the doors in those areas because it's coming. And like two of my favorite agents that um, I did business with in Atlanta um, forever, like I still do business in Atlanta with them. They messaged me. I want to say it was, I want to say it was like a month ago and they're like, yo, you guys are still doing short sales. Right. And I was like, Oh hell. I'm like, yeah, we are. And she's like, we're really starting to see a lot of homes coming to the, coming to the foreclosure steps. Yeah. Um, and I was like, do you guys still only foreclose on the first Tuesday of the month in Georgia? And she's like, your brain is a scary place to live. And I'm like, yeah, it really is. You probably don't want to be there. And she's like, send me over your package. She's like, we're going to go ahead and get to work and we'll start sending them over to you. And I was like, okay. And like I said, like to me, that's very 08 vibey because these are grizzled, grizzled veterans in the real estate industry. Like we're talking people that have been selling houses since the nineties and they're seeing, they're seeing it. They, they are, they're seeing that the writing is on the wall that there's going to be a certain population and segment that's going to need to do it. Like yeah. it just is what it is. It's, it's the it's the best solution when you're this far down the line and you want to like not sell yourself up for failure forever or like not forever but like really crushing you and just I can't mm -hmm. imagine going through a foreclosure all the way. Um, yeah. I know we are at time, uh, Matthew. I appreciate you coming on. I want to kind of rattle through these questions really quickly. Uh, Lenny just said, "Shoot!" So the buyer who takes over the property in a short sale, it's always cash or a new bank loan. The buyer doesn't simply take over the old loan and interest rate. So I think we could kind of also answer that, Ingrid, but Matthew, I'm going to let you answer your side. Correct. So on a short sale, you're shorting the lender and they're extinguishing the underlying debt and any liens and loans and things like that. So 
it's just it, it's going to be cash or um, you know new financing, conventional FHA, VA. It is open to all different types of financing as well. If you want to take over the old, like if you want to start making the payments on the old loan, the interest rate, that would be a subject to transaction. So you're not doing a short sale. Short sale is a different um, way to go through this. Let's do another one here. Soaring said, is there a minimum time from foreclosure you'd need to efficiently, effect, efficiently help them days versus weeks away from foreclosure? So I, let's go back to the example I had of the family last week, um, got a hold of them Sunday night. They were open to talking and I'm like, well, you can't do a loan mod. 37, like I, I was told you need at least 37 days to do a loan mod. I can't do that. They had nobody I could help them. Let, look, now everybody's like, I got questions. Everybody's throwing questions in the side chat. Um, we couldn't do a personal loan. They had no money. They had no family that could help them. Uh, I'm not recommending bankruptcy because that can be fraud and you can, you're going to have a bankruptcy on that person's uh, record. And then they didn't have enough time to list it because their auction was on Tuesday. So is there like, what do you kind of do when you're two days away from an auction? Is there any really solution that you can see, Matthew? And then Ingrid, you can chime in too. Create a finance, baby. That's the only one I can think of uh, if you don't have time for a short sale. Like that's that's the the trigger. And to your point, Caroline, you just have to be um, tenacious in explaining why it's in their in their best that's interest. Just- in fact, you're actually going to build their credit back up. I've done it now. Like I've done a few people. Um, <laughs> I've done a few people. Sorry, that was so <laughs> bad. But um, I've helped a few sellers uh, who put themselves in a bind with bad credit uh, as a result of not paying their mortgage. But because we took over their mortgage, now their their credit is much much better. So, so it's you really the only thing I know that you could really stop right away, so- other than cash. Absolutely. So for everybody on here, should Ingrid, should we just immediately go straight to terms? You already know it's too late. When you're talking to a seller in this situation, instead of saying I can buy your house for cash, should you immediately just go yes. I'll buy your house for terms? Uh, absolutely. That's what I do. That's what I've done. Yeah. And everybody has their own different method. I love the fact that you said you have the mom, uh, the mom you, voice. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know how it is, but I, I, you know, if people do need a closer, contact me. I'm happy to help you talk to your sellers or talk to your agents um, because I've been through this and no third party story will help you more than I've been in your shoes. I went through that experience. Here's how I help you not land where I did. And um, it goes back to the, the team uh, in, in, um, perspective that, that Matthew talked about, because now it's like, I've been there. Let me help you. It's going to be us together. Uh, versus them going on through this journey without you. 100%. That's, you nailed it. The only other thing that I found, and this is obviously, I, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to give legal advice. Um, the only other thing that I know is the guaranteed will stop it and halt it. And it's for your sellers that are just completely, you know, really, really jammed up spot is filing bankruptcy. That's the only other thing, which, you know, again, I'm never going to make that call for people and be like, hey, you should file bankruptcy. Like, nope, that is not my call. Yeah, I I honestly, Caroline, I understand what you're saying. If they're using it as a tactic to just stop the foreclosure, that is considered fraud. But there are scenarios where bankruptcy should be their next step. I, I, I agree with that. Like, I got $20,000 $20,000 in credit card debt. I got a car that I can't pay. I have a house. Like, I mean, you're actually like bankruptcy is a tool to be used. Um, to, to Matthew's point, somebody, you have to make your own decision and there will be a process. I was talking to a young man in Maricopa, super talented sales guy. I was like, Hey, which, whichever way this goes, I want us to talk. Cause I think you would do really well in sales with me and in this real estate world he he's totally for it but he already assessed his situation he's like no i'm going to go through the bankruptcy process because um i have ways to take this bankruptcy off my credit within two or three years that was my next question how can we do that yeah there's all these tactics I'll, i'll be honest with you i don't have any um advice or any sort of like experience in that but there's tactics where bankruptcies can also be mitigated after the fact. Um, and they're not always successful, 
but there are ways around it. Thank yes. you for that insight. I mean, I was on the phone. I actually spoke with Laura because I was talking to her about after door knocking those houses. I'm like, what can I do? Um, I knew that you were on vacation. So she was just like, don't recommend that. That can be a situation where it can get fraud. I know just so I'm not doing it, but give them, like you said, Matthew, you can recommend they have a conversation with a bankruptcy attorney and see if that's the best option for them. And also to your credit, Ingrid, we don't always know their situation. What does their credit look like? How far into debt are they? Are they in more debt besides just the house? Um, okay, let's get through a few more of these. Evan said, I'm sorry if you have already asked this, but if we bring you a short sale, will we get the first chance at buying the property once it's negotiated? What fee would be charged? Yes, and nothing. <laughs> oh, Easy peasy. So ultimately, the bank makes the final decision in everything. So they're going to be the ones that are going to determine the final sales price. If it works with what you're trying to do with the property, you buy it. Um, I'm getting paid via a referral agreement with our partner agent that lists it so that we meet bank compliance. And everyone that brings me a deal, they're always the one that gets the first rights to the property. It's like, hey, um, you know, Ingrid, thanks for bringing this property over to me. Um, you know, do you want to go ahead and submit an offer with our agent, Carolyn, over here? Will that, you know, do you want to submit? Yeah, I do. My offer is going to be ridiculously low. That's the other thing I'm going to tell people. Do not feel bad about your initial offer. Just submit the damn thing. Do mm -hmm. not feel bad about it because the bank at the end of the day is they're in the driver's seat. They're going to let us know whether or not it works or whether, whether it doesn't. Mm -hmm. All right. Follow up question. What's the advantage of doing a short sale rather than sub two? Matthew, I'll let you go first. And I'll let Ingrid and I wrap that up. Yeah. Got it. So again, this really goes to what the seller's position is and where they are in life and what they're trying to do. Um, there are certain loan types that are never going to work on a sub two. The biggest one being a reverse mortgage. I've never seen somebody be like, hey, all right, I did a sub two on a reverse mortgage. They're probably going to, you know, they're, they're probably really going to regret that really fast. Yeah. Um, so it really does come down to the seller because like, let's be honest, there's a lot of sellers, especially once they're in a position like this, they may, you know, they may be in a position of, look, I'm just done with the property. I need the loan out of my name, you know, whatever. And kind of to what we were just talking about with bankruptcy, the last thing you want to do is get a property sub to and then have them file bankruptcy because that's just going to be a disaster for you. So if they're in a pretty jammed up financial position, but they could be in a better position after completing the short sale and maybe get rid of those consumer credit lines and things like that or pay them down and be in a better spot, that's going to be a huge benefit for them right there. Um, okay. Let's see. Um is there a law that says you can't profit from the short sell if you're helping someone? I think what maybe John is alluding to, and I don't know, maybe he is, maybe he isn't. It might be the Mars Act from back in like 2012, and that's the Mortgage Assistance Relief Services Act. What that is, is you cannot charge an upfront fee to a borrower to do a service that is free for the bank. For example, loan mod, short sell. Um, you know, things like that. That being said, there is no reason that you can't profit from a short sell. So for example, you can buy it and you can turn around and profit on it. They have no, they have no issue with that. They might give you deed restrictions that say, Hey, for 30 days, we want you to hold it. And then you can turn around and sell it for 120% of your acquisition cost. Um, after 90 days, we don't give a crap. You can sell it for whatever you want. Gotcha. Okay. You got the next one. How will we wholesale with you? What is the process like with short sales compared to foreclosures? Mm -hmm. A lot of short sale agents, for example, Nicole Espinosa. Got it. So with wholesaling, this is the thing that I'm going to tell you with, uh, with short sales. The bank is not going to take assignment verbiage on uh, a contract for a short sale. They're just not. It's kind of their, their, uh, what is it? It's like their number one rule they won't do. So what I usually tell people is a JV with somebody that you trust and you have a agreement in place, have them take the property down and then turn around and, you know, sell it. Um, you might be involved in a double escrow or something similar to a double escrow. It, you might have to hold it at 30 days. And those are the things that we always try to take into account when we're looking at it and running numbers. Because more often than not, once I'm in the thick of it with the bank, 
I'm going to know whether or not there's deed restrictions. If there's deed restrictions and you have five grand of carrying costs for holding it 30 days, we're going to want to factor that into whatever your whatever your buying offer uh, is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever your offer is. Okay. I think the awesome. last one there is, yep, you already saw it. Corey has a great deal he wants to send over to you. So guys, reach out to him on Instagram. There's a link tree. Matthew Potter Realtor. I'll share it one more time just so everybody can see it. And then let's see, here it is. Here is his Instagram, Matthew Potter Realtor. And there's his link tree. You can message him on Instagram as well. So I hope that was helpful. Um, okay. Ingrid, I know you're down to 75 hard, so I don't think you're in a rush to, to, to drink some I don't water. have to pee. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wanted to show really quickly, guys, because Ingrid and I are really trying to grow this so we can help more people. Matthew, I know I made you a YouTube last time. We need to get people onto your YouTube. So I'm going to show you guys really quickly, everybody. If you would, check this out. We are, okay, I had to go through a different window so I could show everybody this. So when you come over and you should click the subscribe button so you can know when we're going live with Matthew again or in the future, click subscribe. And then right here on this little drop down, click all. So every time we get an alert that we're going to, every time we have something that's going to go live, you get alerted. So this is, you already know my channel at the Caroline Kane. You can look up Ingrid Hernandez. And see her here. Same thing. You want to just go to, oh no, where are you, Ingrid? I don't know. Que pasó? Oh, oh wait, because it corrected your name, it took away the Y when I clicked on that. Ingrid. Oh, how dare it. Okay. I mean, I well, while she's fixing that, there I am, there I am. Boom. Get all the alerts and then Matthew Potter. Hey, hey. And it should be short sale king. Let's see, where is it? What did we do? I don't even know if you've added your photo on there yet. I haven't. I haven't done anything. Right there, yet. It's right in front of you. This is not no. him. Though. I made him one that says Matthew Potter Short Sale King. Mm. This is just a random one. Did. Oh no! Now I gotta find it. I'll work on it. It's this is me, dude. This isn't you. This is me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will. I do want to call something out. So myself and Matthew are part of uh, the same group in at Real Brokerage. We're part of the family tree. Uh, yesterday, in fact, we had a coaching call. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it. I was double booked. Um, but it's one, it's one of my favorite calls because we share different ways to make money as an agent. And in fact, I'm going to be on a podcast um, later this month with uh, JJ Aziz, um, where we talk about what it what it was like for me to go from traditional agent to now licensed investor. That's the way that I market myself um, because there's so much fear that comes from being an agent. And like, I even see it in a lot of the questions we get from people who are licensed where they're like scared of everything, which I understand because that's sort of the mindset that you're trained where it's like, don't make the wrong move or you're going to get sued. Um, so it's, it's been interesting being around folks like Matthew and Pace that help expand my mind and stop being so fearful. So anyway, uh, we would love anybody who is a licensed uh, agent to consider coming with us. Um, you'll have amazing calls like this one on a weekly basis with Matthew at the helm, Ryan Zolan, and sometimes I butt in uh, on giving feedback during those coaching calls on Tuesdays. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure I plugged that in. I love you, that. You I do. Actually, and, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say, I took the time. I'm still logged into your YouTube channel I made for you. So uh -oh. I have it right here. Yeah. She's going to have that thing up to like 5,000 subscribers <laughs> in about 10 minutes. Hey, there um, you go. But I added a photo. Look, I just added your Instagram photo on there. So here's Matthew. It is Matthew Potter. There we go. So that is yes. it. I'm going I'm to get to work on that. I am. There's no subscribers, guys. So please go follow him on YouTube if you got any value. Help this man out so we can get an actual URL. I'm going to copy the URL so you guys can have access to it. But go ahead, Matthew, if you want to chime in on the family tree stuff. Yeah, so a couple of things. Like, I've been watching this chat, and I appreciate you guys tremendously for inviting me on. And I'm always happy to be a repeat offender, especially as we kind of navigate further and further into this new market. Because I think there's probably going to be a good need for, uh, for all of us to be able to work together. And I'm excited for that. One of the things that I noticed was uh, Evan commented over here. I know a short sale negotiator whose model is they negotiate their fee with the bank as a separate fee on the HUD. And then they also charge 10 G's on top of that to the buyer. 
I'm going to let you know that I'm the most underpaid short sale negotiator on the planet. And that's the way I plan on keeping it. I would never do that. I've seen people that do that. And to me, that just reeks of number one, a non-abundant mindset, which that's where I always come from when I'm doing this of like, I would rather do a hundred deals than sit there and do five deals. Um, and the other thing is if I'm charging you 10 G's as a buyer, like, good God, like what? <laughs> like why, why in the world? Like that's a, that's a lot of money. Like that's really going to mess up your spread. Like, like it is. So I just wanted to touch on that. And then I saw one other thing. Uh, Maritza had asked me what state I'm licensed in. So my main state is Arizona. Uh, I am licensed in Arizona. I'm also licensed in North Carolina, Nevada, and uh, Georgia. So um, those are the states that I'm licensed in right now. Uh, I don't plan on adding any more to my continuing education, you know, cycle of fun there. But um, I mean, if it became advantageous, I would, but I'd rather just have more agents join us in our network and that we can just all work together and collaborate on. I think that's just a better way to do it personally. Um, and even like if I get short sales in North Carolina, I'm not listing them. I'm having, I'm having a partner agent do it on the ground. Um, so yeah. Well, thank you for all of this, Matthew. Again, thank you for jumping on here. You have three subscribers on YouTube now, so they can't wait for you to start producing more content. Um, next week, it is, I'm waiting to hear back, but we're going to be talking about more foreclosure stuff. If you can tell, I am just trying to zero in. If we can, uh, we can help more people. It karma comes around guys. What goes around comes around, take care of people. Um, I've been talking about this nonstop since the beginning of the year. And today on one of my zooms that I do in the morning, three people stopped an auction in the last two days, which was just so exciting. So guys, there are people that need help. Go do something kind, pay it forward. Matthew. Thank you. Ingrid. Thank you. We're out of here guys. All right. Have a good one. Bye. Thank everybody. you for having me.